grace, mercy, and peace to you from, from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. For our purposes for today, at least, is about, we might say, God's heart and our hearts and, and starting to get them lined up together. The heart is what's most important or where our desires and, and motivations come from. And this section of Jesus' Sermon on the Plain shows us how God wants his disciples to treat others. Jesus' preaching shows us what the world should look like because the world has gone horribly wrong. And what's the solution? Well, the way out of this mess that Jesus preaches is the love of God, a love that gives without respecting in return, a love that ultimately we know culminates in the cross. It's about generosity and, and willingness to suffer for the good of others. And this giving, this selfless love is exactly how Jesus will live. It's a lot like how God generously gives to the world, even to those who hate him or never give thanks. The psalmist says, the Lord sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. And that's why Jesus instructs us to, to love our neighbors and to give without expecting to be repaid. He tells us to treat others not based on what's good for me or how I feel or what the score is between this person and me. Jesus tells us to treat others the way we want others to treat us. See, Jesus doesn't actually give us laws that can be legislated or enforced. You can't make someone love their enemy. However, God's primary concern is not, we would might say, about the law. It's not primarily about people towing the line. God's primary concern is about healing your and mine and others' hearts. God wants people to connect and work together, not against one another. And that's how he created humanity, to, to take care of creation and one another. And from a sort of, I mean, it doesn't quite say this, but from a philosophical perspective, you might say the world needs to change how it treats one another, and Jesus expects us to make the first step. And as we think about that, we have to admit that we don't always consistently treat others the way that we would want to be treated. There's times when we just do the bare minimum in, for instance, the relationships we have with those around us. Now, I'm not saying you can never take time for yourself or that you should forget about your health. Those are important things. But I suspect that if you're anything like me, there's plenty of times when it's not that I can't do a better job or help others. It's just I may be too lazy or distracted or busy. If you're guilty as charged, well, we don't need to despair. Jesus is in the business of changing hearts. We are being made new, the Bible tells us. For Christians, it's no longer just life as it was. Christ doesn't fit into our way of life. He changes our way of living. He changes our, our way of, of speaking. He changes where our feet go and, and what our hands do. Listen to our, our Savior's words once again. Jesus says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, and bless those who curse you and pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, so do to them. Now, that is a bit daunting, challenging. However, remember, listening to Jesus is different than having a discussion with a friend. We are students or children listening to our Heavenly Father. For confessing Christians, the question, when Jesus speaks, we should not be asking, do I agree with him? We should ask, do I understand it right? Or how, Lord, do I do this? 
we certainly can ask clarifying questions, but the student doesn't get to tell the teacher what's true in this case. And we remember that Jesus is patient with us, but he's also clear. Jesus is not harsh or uncaring, but he does know his stuff. You know, you might be asking, how could you give away your money without expecting anything in return? What would it look like if people or nations started loving their enemies instead of sharing or demanding their rights? What if you gave to people who asked you for things? What if you turned the other cheek instead of always striking back? Well, I think one challenge when we think about Jesus' words is that we immediately go to the big picture and we think, I could never do this always. Uh, but I think as we follow Jesus, it's not, about, it's not really about philosophy so much as it is taking it one day at a time and one circumstance. Certainly some circumstances are different and life is very complicated and not everything fits neatly into specific categories, categories all the time. But what we need to do is take one decision at a time and try to approach it with, with God's love and not worry about how we're going to do everything that Jesus says, but simply how do we do what the Lord has put in front of me today? Well, it still sounds sort of dangerous, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds in many cases impractical or foolish. Even thinking about living like that might require faith. Loving our enemies is not the kind of thing we would or even could do without God's help. But what I don't want us to do is run away from these words or try to find a way around them. Jesus is asking us to start living in this way. Jesus is daring us to live in a way that is very different. Life with Jesus is a challenge, and sometimes it's frightening. When we put ourselves out there, yes, at times we'll be vulnerable. And I wish that I was a good example of this, but honestly, I certainly have not always lived out Jesus' words faithfully. But remember, the God we have and the good news that he's given to us, and that's that we've been forgiven. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to compromise on God's word, even though we don't follow it perfectly. You know, you are sometimes vengeful and stingy when you could be generous or gracious. Be real. We're all sometimes more filled with bitterness than love. And that's why we need a savior, both for his forgiveness and for his guidance. Because we know as we read the scriptures and interact with God that we can't hide from God what we've done. You can't win an argument with God and uh, convincing him that all along he was right or wrong and you were right. So the best thing to do is just be honest and confess your sin instead of pretending you haven't made a mistake. And we're all in the same boat. We are all forgiven. And yes, we fall short and we've not always done as we should have, but Jesus came and he's forgiven and accepted our confession. He did so earlier in our service and will continue to forgive us. So, and so that means we don't have to plot a course that will protect our image. That's what we often do with the challenging parts of God's word, you know, right? We, we don't want to change the trajectory of our lives, so we instead try to change God's word but we don't have to suppress the truth. We can confess the truth, and we have the truth, Jesus, as our Lord. And we can rely on God's grace, both for our past and for our future. He forgives our sins. And don't worry, he also can help you do what you couldn't do on your own. If you think you can't love your enemy, Jesus will show you the way. He'll show you how. If you don't think you can do it, well, you can pray for forgiveness and for help. But we don't have to throw in the towel or give up. Uh, because for most of us, it's probably not as simple as making one single decision. Being generous and loving your enemies is a commitment. It's not a, a one-time decision. It's a, a daily battle. But just because the battle is tough doesn't mean we should... It ain't worth fighting. Thankfully, Jesus doesn't demand that we get it right right away, but he does tell us to live by grace. He gives us love 
and he transforms our hearts so that we can love others as well. Which is why I want to discourage you from worrying too much about listening to Jesus and saying, will this work? God can and does make a way for those who believe. God makes walls fall down for those who believe. He turned, for instance, in our Old Testament lesson, the cruelty and pettiness of the brothers of Joseph into a way to provide for the people of Israel when a devastating famine struck the land. God made Moses' simple wooden staff into a weapon of mass destruction. He made waters come out of rocks. Impossible for you and me often means part of the plan for Yahweh. Is raising the dead impossible? Well, it was until Jesus did it. Is trying to, to follow what Jesus says sometimes difficult or hard? Yes, certainly it is. If you said it was impossible for human beings to live like Jesus instructs us to, that this is impossible for us to do, I really wouldn't argue with you. Loving your enemies and thinking of others above yourself, it's a Holy Spirit thing. It's a gift of God. It's God working in you and me. It's not up to you. It's not your work. It's the work of Jesus shining through your life. And you and I are privileged to be caught up in it. We could just live like everyone else in the world. But why settle for that? We know because our Savior has showed us that there is more. Why settle for that? Almost Almost everybody loves their own tribe, the people closest to them, but we've been called to reflect the great love of God that is overflowing, that can't be contained only the people who love him. We've come to reflect the love of our Savior Jesus Christ to the world around us, and he will help us, and he will forgive us, and he will make something new out of us through the power of his Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.